So you have six million square feet in Florida? It's actually about 10 million square feet and about $2 billion in total asset value. How did your business kind of like scale up? When you first started, maybe you and one or two other people, and then it just kind of like naturally, did it just progress? A lot of mistakes people make is trying to be great at everything, not just for what we do, but for anything. I think it's find something you're good at, train at it, become great at it, and just do that. And that's really what we did. That's that's what we've always done. Today, I have Jason Isaacson at IP Capital Partners, done over $7 billion in real estate transactions. And he's done some pretty incredible things. And he's going to educate a lot of people on where the market is right now, where it's likely headed, and what the best strategies are, and what IP Capital Partners is going to do to capitalize on all this opportunity. Jason, welcome. Thanks for having me today. You're welcome. Pleasure to be here. So you've done $7 billion in transactions. Most of that was a collection of office, uh, industrial, um, hospitality? Mainly, mainly industrial and office properties. Uh, we have a focus on the state of Florida. Uh, we also go into the southeast as well as it relates to industrial, but office we do just in the state of Florida. Uh, historically, we did it because we did office just in Florida because it's an asset class that is very difficult to run. Small mistakes can create large dollar problems. Mm -hmm. So being close to it and being in and out of it every day is more important. It's important in every asset class, but more so in office. So we did it that. We, we, we focused on office just in Florida for that reason. But then once the pandemic came, uh, if you study the, the facts and data, the Florida office market also has performed dramatically differently than anywhere else in the country. We're actually leasing more office space today than we were leasing in 2017, 2018, and 2019. So now we do office in Florida for two reasons. One, because you have to be close to it. And two, because it's probably the only office market in the country where you're actually leasing space today. Yep. I, I heard mm. about a story in California. It was on California Street in San Francisco. Probably heard of it. $300 million uh, deal that traded in 2019 and then is now on a contract for $60 million bucks because it's 75% vacant. People are just, they don't want to sign leases there. Yeah, they're having problems. They're having problems. I think the, the interesting thing about Florida office is from a capital markets perspective, it's, it's experiencing the same issues that offices in San Francisco or New York City or Chicago are experiencing. One, from rising interest rates and two, from just a severe lack of liquidity in the product type right now. But the differentiating factors in those markets even when you own the property, what are you going to do with it? Versus Florida, at least you can lease space. So we we think Florida actually is is Florida office is one of the more interesting and compelling investment opportunities out there right now because of this disconnect between the operating performance of of the asset class mm -hmm. and and the way the the capital markets are treating it. Got it. Do you think that we're going to likely see a continued rent growth at the same velocity we've seen in Florida? I, I think we'll see it in pockets, right? And and we, we're we talking conceptually about Florida. Certainly, there's great places in Florida like Brickell Avenue, and there's places that aren't so great like the I-75 corridor in, in Tampa. So, you know, are Brickell Avenue, are we going to continue to see rent growth? Yeah. Probably. You know, it's, it's supply and demand. There's a lot of demand for office space on Brickell Avenue right now. There's very limited new supply of it. In fact, I, I uh, was, was talking with one of, uh, one of the folks that leased space for us uh, down, down in Miami, and, and that this leasing agent's very active on Brickell Avenue. There's not one full floor of vacancy, office vacancy, on Brickell right now. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. I was in uh, Los Angeles when everything kind of got a little crazy, and uh, everything was basically vacant. All, all uh, ground level uh, in downtown LA, uh, 5th and 6th Street, a lot of the prime streets, restaurants, um, but there was just so much uh, active. Yeah, but you you can you know you can you could study the statistics like we do. But also a big part of real estate is seeing it and touching it and and feeling it. Yeah, you can go walk on Las Olas Boulevard. You could go walk on Rosemary Square in West Palm Beach. You you can go to um, um, West Shore in in Tampa, and it's it's vibrant. Yep, there's people out. They're going to lunch. They're going to work. They're doing all those things, and and that's. That's what's propelling the Florida office market. Yeah. My wife's family came. Uh, they stayed in West Palm Beach uh, about two weeks ago, and we went out to grab some food, and it was just very lively. It was beautiful. It was an incredible experience, and uh, felt it just felt like the right place to be. Do you think that we're going to see any type of disruption in office, or do you think 
looking back at what's happened the last few years of people's kind of their spending habits and uh, this work from home situation, do you think we're going to see more people look to um, kind of expand or maybe restructure current operations? Or how do you see office changing? We definitely do. There's a, there's a change that came about from the pandemic and the way we think about office use, right? The, the difference in Florida is we had more good yep. that came mainly from population and wealth growth, definitely. which if you think about those, the combination of those two things, it's, we believe it's the most powerful economic force out there. Mm-hmm. You think when people, and especially when, when capital flows into a geography, it creates demand for goods and services. It supplies labor right. to support that need. And for those goods and services for that, and for that labor, what do you need? We need space. Mm-hmm. We call it the people to space ratio, which is just a silly way of saying the more people, the more space they need, right? right? So everyone that moved to Florida, they needed a home, right? So you saw the housing market go up. They also needed a doctor, a lawyer, an accountant, a wealth manager, et cetera, et cetera. And all those people use office space. They also brought their businesses down here. Yep. We had... In about a two-year period, we had almost 200 new-to-Florida businesses lease over 5 million square feet in the state. Post Yeah, doesn't surprise me at all. So now, that doesn't, those are the positives, right? That doesn't mean we didn't have businesses that went to work from home or some sort of hybrid environment. It's just what happened down here is that office using employment was greater than the negative effect of working from home. And that's why we've had positive office space absorption in many markets across the state. Yep. I would have never visualized myself being in Florida three and a half, four years ago. Um, We ended up coming here. We ended up buying a home. We ended up leasing an office. You know, Dominic is doing sound. Like we have uh, people here that work here and we're supporting the economy of Florida. And it wouldn't have been because of any other reason for what's happened the last couple of years. It's just a much better place for for business, for lifestyle, for a lot of things. Yeah. And it's not just it's not just people like you and I talk to the 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 Ken Griffins of the world and hear what they have to say and and you know they're Kathy Wood and all these different people it, coming it, to Florida. Exactly. I mean we're, we're you know they're not people like us that lease four thousand, five thousand square feet. They're leasing five hundred thousand square feet, eight hundred thousand square feet, really creating a new ecosystem a new economic ecosystem down down in the state. What do you think about the, um, like what's happening in some pockets uh, outside of Florida, maybe a little bit in Florida, but where they're basically rezoning office and turning it into residential. Have you heard anything about that? It's 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 a process, right? Because mm-hmm. converting, I mean, we, we certainly heard about it. It's not something that we do at, at our firm. Um, but certainly when you look at some of the big cities where you have these older, office buildings that are essentially either are or have are becoming obsolete re repurposing those buildings for for new or a use that that could be helpful you know the issue with it is it's not cheap to convert an office building to a residential building so you need the price to get to a point that warrants investment so you're certainly seeing some Things from the political class putting out incentives to do that. Yeah, I was reading about um, that last. So night. that's that's kind of one thing that that helps that, and the other is just you know the the process of coming to Jesus uh, with the the owner or the lender of of you know letting that property go essentially for a price if that's the only use for it, right? Got it. So how did you get to where you are right now? And now you're in Florida. Obviously, this is your main focus, but you went to Syracuse, and how did how this whole thing kind of come about? So I, I have to say this because it's, you know, I, otherwise my wife would, would yell at me when I got home. Everything is because of her, okay? <laughs> so I started in real estate in 1997 when I was graduating college. And um, I had no idea what I wanted to do with my life. I didn't turn it an investment bank. And I said the, the summer before, and I said, ooh, this is terrible. Who wants to live like this and do this? And... Um, my wife was, I don't remember if it was the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal, but it literally was a paper, a newspaper with an ad for a uh, real estate investment training program through um, a Goldman Sachs-owned company called Archon Group, which basically was the uh, manager of Goldman's Whitehall Funds. Cool. And back in 1997, doing real estate wasn't cool, so I was 
capable enough to earn that job. Yeah. And that's literally how I started in real estate. I went to work with for Archon Whitehall in 97 by answering a ad in a paper after graduating. Hmm. And I just fell in love with, with real estate and stuck with it ever since. So what was that first like year like? Well, what did you do? Uh, you know, much of it, it was, it was an analyst role. So it's, it was very much a institutional, institutional fund manager of, of real estate, Mm -hmm. buying everything from office to apartment buildings, hotels. So would you underwrite, you would just basically underwrite Yeah, just under, underwriting, underwriting transactions, uh, that, that type of stuff. Did you get to work with people that were like maybe in the same room or next to you, uh, that were raising money and you kind of got to. Listen at, to at that, how that worked. At that point in my career, I was not in the capital raising aspect of it. You know, that was done. And this was, you know, Whitehall would raise billion dollar funds back when a billion dollars was considered a lot of money. Yeah. Um, so they were one of the few groups that had that type of buying power in the market. So a lot of what we were, an- what I was analyzing there was large portfolios, you know, bad loan portfolios or large property portfolios, um, et, et cetera. And then um, wound up moving down here about 23 years ago. Also, because my wife said we're moving to Florida, we um, at that time we were in the Washington D.C. area, and um, which is where I'm from, and uh, we live close by my parents. And my wife said, if we don't um, get out of here, we're going to be divorced within five years because I can't stand being by your mother. <laughs> And so we moved and yeah. she was right. Cause we're about to this December, it'll be 25 years of, of marriage. So my wife was right again. Uh, she is from South Florida. So we moved down here. Uh, I worked for a large family office uh, for about five years before starting, you know, essentially the first iteration of, of IP capital partners. Great. So the family office, were they also investing, um, in in this segment or segment of real estate, they the that that family invested from everything from uh, real estate through corporate opportunities, and I I focused on the real estate side of of their business, and then um, in two thousand five um, started the first iteration of of IP Capital. So we've been through, you know, at least one big downturn before, um, and and learned a lot of lessons from from that how to you know restructure debt and and come up with a game plan. Uh, started raising small, smaller, um, our own private equity funds, vehicles, um, where we're uh, right now setting out to raise our fourth uh, value fund. We also have a, a different um, risk platform, a core fund, which invests in, in kind of longer duration coupon clipping industrial assets. And then we have a value fund, which focuses on you know, more distress and an ability to play in what the opportunities we think are coming um, for us. So we're, we're, um, we're had just, we've just gotten going and raising our fourth value fund. So you, um, before I dive into that, you said you obviously went through the great financial crisis. You learned some lessons right now, the last couple of years, I and mean, it's been pretty incredible what's happened in the real estate market. And a lot of people, um, you, we mentioned before you were recording that some people, um, will also, uh, learn, I guess, some lessons or maybe you know, the economy might be going through a changer something like that. If we step into a situation like this with new investors that maybe maybe are going to learn some lessons as the people are underwater, I believe is what the conversation was, what lessons could they learn or did you learn that maybe could benefit them? I think th- there's two things you need when you have a distressed piece of real estate. One is a plan. Mm-hmm. And then two, that plan generally will entail a need for capital. So you need a plan and then you need money to, mm-hmm. to execute that plan. And if you have those, those two things, you normally can, with a logical counterparty, right? In this case, your lender can work out a fair solution to reset the capital stack. Right. Because they don't want to take that property back. No, no. Look, look, look lenders, banks, insurance companies, they're, they're not equipped to go out and, and run real estate, especially local pieces of real estate, which require rolling your sleeves up and, and getting dirty. You know, we've, we've real estate over the last 25 years has turned into kind of a very sexy institutional mm-hmm. business, but it's, it's really kind of a, a gritty asset class. You've got to roll up your sleeves. You've got to improve things. You've got to 
least space, all those things are hand-to-hand combat. Mm-hmm. They're not these kind of big things, concepts that are talked about in the Wall Street Journal or Bloomberg. They're the day-to-day grind of what it takes to turn a property from underperforming into a performing piece of real estate. And so banks, and they're, they're just not set up to do it. It's a different skill set. It's a different mindset. Um, and, and generally, be, you have to be local too, right? I mean, imagine running a, a little office building in Plantation, Florida from New York City. Like, how, how are you going to do that? Right. Yeah. So, I mean, it's very, uh, it is very that, like what you just said. So, like, the last, the last few years, it's been quite the opposite. Most people thought that real estate's the sexiest, easiest way to get rich. And a lot of people were just, uh, they would enter the space. They would try to buy something with very little game plan or very little experience. Um, but I guess, ultimately, during these periods in which there's, maybe a little bit more hesitancy, it comes more opportunity to make a lot of, I guess, create a lot of value. Right. As a, as a value buyer, these are the moments you, yeah. you, you wait for, right? The, the last several years, money was easy. You mm-hmm. could go and find financing for, for cheap. You could pass the hat around to your friends to raise equity because everyone thought it was easy. And now um, the market is not only cost more, but it's, it's liquidity has been sapped from it. And so, you know, we always focus on, on two things when we're looking at what drives real estate value. One is the cost of capital, i.e. interest rates. Mm-hmm. And the other is the availability of it, liquidity. They're both extremely important, but we've always believed that liquidity is more important than the cost of capital. Because when there's, when there's no liquidity, that cost of capital goes up because right. people can charge more for it, for the money, it's, et cetera, et cetera. And when the market's liquid, those spreads start getting condensed. So right now, the market is expensive and it's a liquid. Mm-hmm. So if you're sitting on a lot of capital, you have opportunity. Definitely. If you have to go out and raise money, good luck. Yeah, it's definitely, a, I think it, we're stepping into probably one of the best periods ever to raise money if you can raise it. Yeah, it's, it's um, if, if you can raise it. I, I think raising money is very difficult right now. You've got, you know, Capital really comes from two places, the institutional world and then private capital, the, the, the individuals. Both of those groups are hesitant at the moment in time. So having a platform that has existing investors, that has existing capital, is, is those are the groups that are going to have the most opportunity right now because they have capital to go invest in, into this market. Got it. Where do you, you mentioned interest rates. Where do you think interest rates... Uh, could be headed in the next, you think that they're going to hit a pause potentially? And I guess no one can predict, but in the next six months? Yeah, I, look, we're, we're, they're slowing down. Whether they go up a little bit or stay exactly where they are, I don't think it really matters much at this point in time. Like most of it's, it's, it's in there. I think right now it's, it's the, 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 the thing we're looking at is how long do they stay up for before they have to come down? Uh, if if you look at the forward curves, it looks like it's a pretty short duration for them to stay high before they drop them pretty quickly. I think they're going to stay higher longer. Um, that's just speculation. Yeah. I don't have. There's. I don't no, think Carl Icahn was saying the same thing. Yeah, yeah. he was saying but, he thinks that they're probably going to stay a little bit more stubborn than most people are anticipating. Yeah, I, 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 I look. The the economy, for whatever reason, has been resilient. Right, it hasn't kind of necessarily pulled back in the manner you'd expect it to. Not that. Mm-hmm. It, hasn't some, but it hasn't pulled back in the manner you expected it to. But I think for a group like ours, uh, you know, obviously at some point you need them to come down because we want to sell those assets at yeah. some point. But the longer, the, the longer the duration that they stay elevated, the more opportunity for us. Definitely, because the more pain in the market, of course. And the higher the interest rates, the as you mentioned, the higher cost of capital, the less the building is actually going to yield on the resale market. The market uh, likely will, I believe. Yeah reprice these assets based at lower interest rates later point in time. Right. If if interest rates tomorrow fall black back to, you know, from 6% to 3%, well, what what do you think is happening right now with the uh you mentioned it's going to stay stubborn most likely a little bit longer and other people are saying the same thing with the 2 and a half trillion dollars in uh, you know, bridge debt and debt that needs to get refied over the next two years. Well, that's where the fun comes in, right? Exactly. Um look, it's as we talked about it earlier, you need a plan and you need capital. So if a borrower has a plan and has a capital and has capital to execute that plan, why wouldn't its lending institution make a deal with them? Yeah. Right. Uh, versus just selling it 
out into the marketplace, which takes time and you don't know who your counterparty is going to be, et cetera. But I think the problem is, is there's a lot of borrowers out there that they may have a plan, but they don't have capital. They may not have a plan either. Yeah. They don't have equity in the deal. They're upside down on the deal. The deal's not cash flowing. They don't have any. Or they don't have the ability to bring fresh capital into it, right? A lender's not going to discount unless you can say, okay, here's the money it's going to, here's my plan to get from A to Z. And to get to A to Z, you don't mean to harp on it, but it's going to cost something. Yeah. You've got to, it costs money when you lease space. You have tenant improvements. You may have to make physical improvements to the, the real estate itself to make it more leasable. You may have to replace building systems. All those things cost money. And if you can't prove to the lender that you've got the capital to do those things, why would they make a make a deal with you? Right. So you're raising a fund right now? We are. We are. Well, tell me, how, how's this, what is this fund? What is, what's the... So uh, this is, as I said, this is the the fourth fund in our value fund series. Um, we're raising 125 million dollars to go out and buy you know, distressed industrial and office properties. I think we'll see more distress in office than we will in industrial, but that there's you know still situations in industrial where people have bought things at three caps and put floating rate debt on it over the last yeah. few years, and definitely that floating rate debt costs six, and now and you can't. And, and you can't recap out of it, and so there's there's problems there. Um, but certainly in in, in office, it, it suffers that problems, but also from a massive suck of liquidity out of out of the space as well. Uh, so it's to go out and, and capitalize on those opportunities. It's something we've proven over the last 17 years that we can find these things and and essentially fix them and and materially increase the value. So that's that's what we're looking to do. So. We just started the process, and we'll we'll probably have a closing uh, around the end of end of the year, December, January. Great. So, do you do you specialize in certain pockets of Florida? You, like when you mentioned near Tampa, or uh, like do you want to stay within forty five minutes of the city for, or like thirty minutes of a so city? It, for- so, on the office side, we really focus on the the six major markets: the Tri County, Miami, Dade, Broward, Palm Beach. Um, in Tampa, Hillsborough and Pinellas, uh, Orlando, mainly Orange County, and then and then Jacksonville. So from, that's from an office perspective. So where there's real, there's there's dynamic demand drivers. First, not to you know, um, you know, if you look at like a a Southwest Florida, it's a great market. There's great homes. There's great communities. That don't don't get me wrong. There's nothing wrong with those places, but they're not dynamic demand drivers there. The, uh, the office users in, in, in a market like Southwest Florida is mainly just a service business economy to service the people there versus right. you come to Miami and you've got finance, you've got tech, you've got international trade, you've got, yeah, you all, got everybody. Uh, dynamic demand drivers coming from, from most different angles. Um, industrial is very different. You know, Everywhere needs distribution space. Um, we have a few areas that we focus more on others um, specifically, um, and, and not, not to give away the secret sauce, it's, sure. it's, uh, but, but to, but to touch a little bit, we, one, we call Florida to Florida distribution. So these are really central Florida markets where you can touch all 22 million residents of the state from the middle. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, and when you think about how our consumption habits, i.e. moving from really going to buy things at storefronts to having things directly delivered to our doorstep. Um, you're, we're moving from a, a hub and spoke distribution model to a point to point distribution model. So we see that epicenter in the state of Florida being markets in the center of the state, like Ocala, Lakeland, even parts of South Jacksonville. Can you touch a little bit more on that? Um, well, then, well, with, when you said, uh, the two different models, so like, um, not like more like secret sauce, but what you were saying when, um, when you're saying be in the center of Florida, the hub and spoke. I didn't. I wasn't following that. So you know, we um, um, historically you 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 know have a model where Atlanta was. A, it still is a great yeah, distribution yeah. market, but everything would come to Atlanta, and we take Atlanta to you know the the retailer or right right right. right? So it's it's business to business. It's a, yeah. it's a hub and spoke model. Now we're going direct to consumer. Yeah. So, you know, for example, we own a 2 million square foot warehouse in Ocala. Uh, we lease about a million square feet there to Costco. 
So Costco does all of their bulk distribution in the state of Florida from this warehouse. So not if you're buying toilet paper or bottled water like I just drank or right. potato chips, but if you buy a couch from from um, Costco, piece of furniture. So that gets delivered from the warehouse, our warehouse in Ocala, mm -hmm. to let's say here in Boca Raton, there'll be a local last mile leg. It'll deliver it right there to that last mile, and then that last mile delivered to your doorstep. Right. So we've seen these markets like Ocala be the epicenter for direct to consumer distribution for the state of Florida. And now we're a big state, so to be in one spot and be able to connect to 22 million people is a pretty important component of the supply chain, we believe. So we think some of these markets that have historically been sleepy little markets will, over the next five to 10 years, kind of develop into primary marketplaces. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Yeah. Um, other are port related markets. So Florida has five of the top 25 port trading ports in the country. Um, if you think about inventory management, I mean, we all can remember and still are experiencing the inability to get stuff that we want. So we've been operating for the last 20 years under what's called a just in time inventory management model, which is just as it sounds. It's basically you use quick delivery systems like air cargo, et cetera, when a retail or a distributor needs something, boom, they don't keep in their warehouse. They call, it gets delivered just in time. Yep. And we saw the, the frailty to that system and still are experiencing it. So we're, we're seeing distributors move from a just in time inventory management model to a just in case inventory management model, which is also just how it sounds. They'll just be more safety stock. Right. And so if you think about where we are today, we're still our inventory levels in this country as of the end of the year, we're still about five, 6% below where they were in 2019. And then if you think, okay, we're going to have a safety stock or just idle inventory of about five to 10%, you're talking about a 10 to 15% increase in inventory levels from where we are today. That nationally will generate two to 3 billion square feet of space demand, which is about the same magnitude as e-commerce. And where do we believe most of this inventory will sit? Port-related markets. Why? Because transportation costs account for over 50% of the logistics process. So it defies logic for goods to come in to port and then just be willy-nilly shipped around places that mm -hmm. they'll stay in those port markets as idle inventory before they go, go out. So the five Florida ports, um, and even up into the southeast, Charleston, Savannah, are, are markets that we're very, very focused on as, as well. Got it. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. And, and then finally, it's just you know your basic last mile distribution. Supply chain lines are built out to mirror population growth. Where's population growing more than anywhere else here? So we just you know find those pockets in in supply constrained locations, so you can't build more of it. And we think we'll see a lot of rent pressure in those places. Yeah, I, that makes yeah, hundred percent agree with yeah. you. Yeah, it's all just basic logic. Yeah. So what like so? How does like for example if you see a great deal, uh, how would you know to identify this deal based on, um, of course, the area, the location, maybe the square footage, uh, potentially lot size, you know, maybe zoning, whatever it may be. Um, is there something that you look for maybe that you would see, be like, okay, this actually would make a lot more sense that maybe a lot of other people would overlook? I think, I think building pipeline, building deal flow is, is what we're talking about here. And uh, there's no real secret sauce to it. It's just grit and grind. It's being in the markets every day. It's knowing the players in the market, yep. the brokers, the owners in today's world, the lenders that control a lot of debt that may be going bad. It's a lot of data mining, right? Understanding, uh, like we talked about, where what are the, the themes that we like and then finding things within in those markets, in those those themes and understanding, hey, where may there be a building that's going vacant where maybe the seller could be in a little distress or things like that. So we're doing that every day at our desk. We're talking every day with the people in the market. Right. We're boots on the ground in those markets, walking it every day. And the combination of those things, it would build deal pipeline. And then you're looking physically at the physical characteristics of the real estate. But I think a lot of it, the, the physical characteristics are more, hey, what can I charge for it, right? Is it brand new? with all the, the dock systems that we need and the clear heights that are perfect today. Obviously, you can charge more rent for that than an old gritty building 
um, in, in, let's say, Riviera Beach. But Riviera Beach is also one of the best last mile markets there is. So you can look at these little gritty buildings and they still have utility, even though some of the, the, the physical aspects are obsolete. They're important because of that last mile aspect. So it's more, you know, building pipeline to find things that fit in the themes and then pricing them accordingly based on what we need to do physically to the asset and then what can we charge and rent and then what does that mean we could we could pay for it. Do you ever build ground we up? Do, we we don't develop. We we don't develop. Um I think it's a it's a different discipline um and probably for a podcast for a different day I think it's a much higher risk proposition because yep. whatever you're building today you're hoping the market will be there or will to support the same it later for 3 years down the road. So it's just the, 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 not, not that it's not a good model. It's just, we raise capital for a specific purpose and we stick to that purpose. Got it. Do you ever uh, buy a deal with a specific anchor tenant in maybe in mind? You're like, oh, this would be perfect for this for other relationship that I have. Look, sometimes you get lucky, right? Yeah. Where the moon, the star and the suns line up. But, but um, yeah, it's, it's hard to build a platform based on having a tenant in your pocket. Right. Right. Um, sometimes it happens. It's happened before. Yeah. Um, but, but not most of the time it's, it's, Hey, we have a developed theme. Like we've talked about Florida to Florida distribution, Florida ports, last mile and sticking within that theme to, to, um, capture the demand in those segments. So when, when you're saying you're, you're obviously doing uh, office and you're also doing a uh, warehouse, what percentage is, uh, the fun focused on 50, 50, or are you leaning a little more on one side? So the, the current fund we're raising has a, a cap of 40% office. While I think it's the single best risk-adjusted return opportunity out there right now, we also recognize it's also the riskiest. Mm -hmm. Because we don't know. We, we know pretty well like the operating side in Florida. We understand that we can lease space, what we can rent it for, et, et cetera. What we don't know are future liquidity flows to office. And so if you're buying an office today, you don't necessarily need liquidity to office to go back to where it was, but for it to be successful, it can't stay where it is, which is zero. Mm -hmm. You need some, some liquidity to grease the wheels of commerce in, in, the, in the sector. Got it. Yeah. You, you, uh, before we started filming today, you mentioned, uh, or we discussed, you bought a deal maybe a year and a half ago or two years ago for $77 million. And it was... Was it three office buildings? Right. So that is, um, if I let me back, if I didn't say it, we're capping the office investment to forty percent of the fund. So you know it'll be at most sixty percent industrial, forty percent office in, in the the fund we're raising. Uh, yes. Yeah, so the deal you're referencing is Fountain Square. It's twenty six hundred to twenty seven hundred North Military Trail. Um, you know, just like we talked about the we talked about the people to space ratio. Yeah. And we focus one of the themes in office is markets that have high people to space ratios. So where we sit here today, Boca Raton is one of those markets. It's attracted a lot of population growth and not just population growth, but wealthy population growth. And wealthy people normally own their own businesses. Mm -hmm. So they move down here and they've leased space. So Fountain Square is a great example of a of sticking within that theme and and we've leased you know, I think we when we bought the property um, about a year and a half ago, it was seventy five percent lease. We're pushing ninety percent lease today. We were doing when we bought the property, lease rates were in the high twenties, triple net. We're now in the mid thirties, triple net. So part of that is just great operations. Right uh, to pat our, I'm biased, pat ourselves on the back, but 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 a good portion of it too is leaning into that people to space ratio, where we have high demand coming from new to market entrance mm -hmm. and we have limited s supply. I mean, there's no, can you name an office building that you see going up in Boca Raton over the last five years? No. Over the last 10 years? Because mm -mm. there hasn't been one, right? So lack of supply combined with strong demand has created a, a very compelling operating environment. Got it. So that was three buildings. They were all operated, uh, uh, prior to your acquisition, relatively the same. same yeah, it's it's a it's a campus. It's a campus known as Fountain Square. So, one of the the things we've done was, you know, it was just it felt like just three buildings kind of next to each other. So, excuse me. What we've really done is to create a 
campus-like atmosphere. So we've reactivated a fountain there, updated all the landscaping and the lighting, redid all the pavers, repainted the buildings, created um, um, areas on the campus with sail shades and furniture where you can come out of your office and and have outdoor spaces to work or to socialize or things like that. So a lot, a lot of what we've been improving office buildings with in Florida, one, one of the things we've seen from the people coming from other, other places is people come here because they like the weather. They like the outdoor. They like the outdoors. So creating outdoor amenities at office buildings so you can have both indoor space in your office and outdoor space as well where we create these campus-like like settings. Got it. What what uh what other changes do you see coming to the Florida uh, market? Do you think insurance is going to be a situation that um, maybe could be a little bit different in the future than it was in the past in terms of cost? Look, it's it's you know people bring up insurance in Florida like it's like it's a new issue. I yeah. mean, I, I've been living here for twenty three years. There hasn't been a moment down here where securing insurance hasn't been difficult and costly. So. I'll, I'll, I'll answer the questions from two point of point of views. One, I think the people that have moved down here, they, they're, they're not stupid people. It, they recognize insurance as the cost of doing business, whether it's you're buying a home or moving a business or for whatever, it wasn't a surprise that insurance costs a lot of money down here mm-hmm. when they moved down here. So I think it's baked in to the, to the psyche that people have, it's the cost of doing business in Florida. Um, the other piece of it certainly is, you know, the there there needs to be some sort of solution figured out, which is probably some sort of public-private partnership between the state, between the federal government, and and private insurance companies as well, and not just for Florida, but any place where you where you're subject to climate risk. And and by the way, you know, we like to pick on Florida, but just there's not really a geography in the country where you're not subject to climate risk right now. Right. I mean, look at, you know, California with earthquakes and fire. Um, you've had the big freezes in, in, in Texas. You have the tornadoes across the, uh, the, 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 the plain states. In fact, you've had worst hurricane damage up in the Northeast from some of the storms than you've seen down here in, in the state of Florida. Yeah, so, there was even a huge storm in Philly like a year and a half ago where... Right, so, so it's... it's Look, we get the brunt of it for where we are, and yeah. and probably rightfully so. But insurance, I I don't believe it's just a Florida issue. It's it's a global issue that deals with climate and and a lot of complicated um, um, inputs to it. And so I think we'll see some sort of public private partnership that solves these issues. Um, and and look, I mean the 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 head the headline now. It's really the residential space where, where the inability to get insurance is a problem. We haven't, certainly in our commercial portfolio, we've seen the costs go up, but we just did our renewal in February, March. Getting it wasn't an issue, but certainly the cost of it has, has, has gone up. And, and that's, you know, when you're looking at homes down here, you see a lot of homes that were built not to, to sub-hurricane standards or et cetera versus you know, if you're buying modern office buildings or warehouse buildings, they're they're built to withstand uh, impacts uh, better. Yeah. So why did you, uh, I guess earlier in your career, you didn't, I guess, jump into the single family market like a lot of people did. Like in 2009, 10, 11, a lot of people were diving in. Uh, they were raising money and picking up, seemed like a lot of single family homes, uh, like Invitation Homes, Blackstone Founded. A lot of other companies are you know, trying to accumulate it, was it just like too tedious and too much? It didn't make a lot of sense for what your ultimate goals were, obviously. Look, I, I think a lot of mistakes people make is trying to be great at everything. Yeah. And not just for what we do, but for anything. I think it's find something you're good at, train at it, become great at it, and just do that. Yeah. And that's really what we did. That's that's what we've always done. Like if, if we started doing just office and and over the last uh, a decade or so, we we brought industrial onto the platform as well, and that's because industrial is just a simpler uh, a, a simpler version of our operating of our office operating platform. Mm-hmm. So the operating platform is very similar. Office is much more complicated, but it's a very different operating platform to go out and 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 manage residential. And our feeling is, 
let the people who are really good at that do that, and we'll stick to what we're really good at. Yeah. So one of the, of one of the most famous boxers said, uh, he was in a little debate with a TV journalist, and he said, "Your issue is you become you try to become a man of many things and a master of nothing." Yeah. He focuses on boxing. And only that's boxing. a that's a great thing. We like, we keep our blinders on. We're 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 good at those things, and and uh, and that's what we stick to. Maybe we're good at other stuff, but probably not. Yeah. So when you like how how did your business kind of like scale up when you first started your firm? Did it, it was maybe you and one or two other people, and then it just kind of like naturally did it just progress or? Yeah, it was it was uh, you know my my partner and I kind of after the the finan- the, the first the financial yeah. crisis in eight nine we we looked at our business model and decided to pivot from kind of raising money individually to raising a investment management platform, raising private equity funds, and yeah. a way to aggregate it and be able to start to scale and and do more things coming out of the the financial crisis, and it just led to. You know, hey, in Fund One, we raised thirty million dollars, and now we're raising one hundred twenty-five million dollars. So it it uh, um, it's just one of those things that you build upon it, um, and and we've built the team around it too. So we've we've built a great team here, and and just grown the business organically. Really, what is a like a like a typical investment look like with IP Capital Partners? Is it like you do you have an investment minimum? Yeah, so we our investment minimums are a million dollars in the fund. Um, so we're generally raising from ultra high net worth through institutional investors and everywhere in between, like family offices. So um, that's that's been our traditional um, in, investor base. Uh, it's it's done in a commitment format. So you make a capital commitment when we close a fund. You don't actually, if you invest a million dollars, you don't actually just invest a million dollars on that day. Mm-hmm. We have a three-year investment period. And so over that three-year period, the fund, that particular fund will make investments. And as we make investments, we'll call capital for your percentage right? Um, and uh, of the deal, right? So if there's $100 million and you're 1 million, you're 1%. So every time we call capital, we call whatever the aggregate capital is, we'd call 1% of it from you up into the point where we've Met the requirement. We've we've invested all of your commitment, right? Uh, or it times out. We have we have three years to call it. Um, so we've either invested the money inside three years, or it's timed out, and we can't call capital for new investments after that period. How long is the typical investment period? Three years. Oh, okay. So the typical investment period is three. Are, are the the value funds are cradle to grave um, eight years. So we're investing for the first three years and have the ability to call that capital commitment that you've made to us. Only up to that capital commitment, we can't call more. Uh, and then we're typically holding assets three to five years and then liquidating them and returning capital and hopefully profit um, at that point in time. Got it. So it's self-liquidating. You know, We buy real estate, we buy it, fix it, sell it, and it takes about eight years for that all to work through. So when when uh, like two thousand nine ten when you were kind of like restructuring what um, you know I guess into the, what you're doing now were you when you switched away from I guess private placement from general public to uh, institutional is it easier now because you're speaking with you know, I guess less people and probably there's less emotion involved when you're dealing with like an institution I don't, or you know I don't, I don't raising capital is never easy. Um, you know, people are skeptical in nature. Yeah. I'm skeptical. You're skeptical, uh, right? And and so it's it's never easy. And you're you're always um, having to explain the investments thesis and explain the story and and not just say, hey, look, we've done in the past, but to be able to paint the picture of how you're going to do it in the future. And certainly in a moment like we are today, where people are holding a little tighter onto their dollars, it's it's hard to do. So. You know, you 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 always have to be great, right? You can't you can't rest on your laurels. Um, yeah, I mean, your track record speaks for itself. Uh, I'm really happy to have you on. One thing I would want to mention here is that I cold called Jason about six weeks ago, um, and we got him on the phone, and he was just a very personable, easygoing guy, um, successful with no ego, which is very rare because it seems like a lot of people. Um, either have a big track record and no ego, or a very little track record with a massive ego, and it's very hard to get a hold of them. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's very interesting. I would definitely look into what he's doing because I'm sure it's uh, going to pan out really well for him in the future. Appreciate that. Strong opinions, but no ego. 